Welcome to the Science of Self. I'm Russell, founder of Newton Media Group, and today we're going to help you improve your life from the inside out. Stick around. Today is September 14th, 2023. On our lunch menu today, from nationaltoday.com's holiday list, we'll be having a hoagie with a side of Rosa Tequila, followed by a gobstopper and a cream-filled donut. We can take some other liberties as well if we wish, as today is also Food is Medicine Day, whatever that means. The book How to Therapize and Heal Yourself from Nick Trenton is our source for today's episode on behavioral activation. Remember, however, that thoughts are just one part of the puzzle. Let's now look at Nick, who would tell you, in no uncertain terms, that he's depressed. Nick has plenty of distorted thoughts. I'm not good at anything. There's no point in trying. I'll probably just fail anyway. I don't care about anything, and nothing makes me happy anymore. He tries his best to challenge these thoughts. He tells himself that he is good at some things, that he should keep putting himself out there, keep trying new stuff, and reminding himself of his blessings. It doesn't work. Why? Let's take a closer look at Nick's life. He lives at home in a cramped room. He hates cleaning the place up, so he procrastinates, and the place gets steadily worse until he can't bear it and feels ashamed about the mess. He's overweight, but every time he goes to the gym, he realizes just how out of shape he is. It seems like it takes three days to recover from even a basic workout session, so he quickly loses motivation, beating himself up for being such a lazy weakling. He needs to find a better job so he can move out, but every time he looks at his resume, he wants to scream. He puts that off, too. He used to get a lot of joy out of his hobbies and meeting up with friends, but he can't be bothered with any of that now. In fact, all he seems to have time for is junk food, gaming, which he doesn't really enjoy anyway, and watching TV. Pretty grim, right? Nick's problem is that when he says, I just don't care anymore, this is not really a cognitive distortion. He's correct. At the same time, how can he genuinely convince himself to reframe his thoughts? I'm a talented individual with plenty to offer, and I enjoy my life. When his room is a pigsty, he's unfit and 60 pounds overweight, and he's wasting six hours every day zoned out in front of the screens. He might believe it for a little while, but not for long. Clearly, he needs an approach that's very different from Claire's. In the 1970s, Peter Lowenson and his research team at the University of Oregon came up with a way to treat depression called behavioral activation. Lewinson was influenced by behaviorism, which is the understanding that your environment has an enormous effect on how you act. This is not to say that thoughts and feelings don't feature, only that they're not the only thing that counts. In general, Behaviorism rests on two main tenets. When you get a reward for something, you're likely to do it again. If you cook for people you care about and they tell you how good it is, you'll probably want to cook again and maybe even get better at it. When you get in trouble for something, you tend to stop doing it. If you cook for people you care about and they criticize you and your food, it's understandable that you might not want to try again. B.F. Skinner, a well-known behaviorist, thought that a person gets depressed when their environment pushes them too much and gives them too few rewards. To put it another way, it can be hard to get motivated to do much of anything when everything seems hard or painful. Depression can cause physical symptoms like tiredness and changes in energy, which can also play a role. Depression can make you think that no matter what you do, you will fail. But you can probably see the issue with Nick. The less he does, the lower his sense of accomplishment, so the less he gets done. The less he takes care of his health, 
the harder it is to get fit again. Going to the gym, then, is a painful experience that yields very little benefit, at least not at first. If he was fit, going to the gym may feel like a pleasant and rewarding experience, but he's not, so he's increasingly less inclined to do it. Depression, understood in these terms, is simply a case of momentum. It's hard to change the way you think if nothing changes in your life. What's the way out of this horrible spiral? Behavioral activation has you do something to feel better instead of waiting until you feel better to do something. Behavioral activation for depression is about making your life meaningful and pleasurable again. It involves these steps. 1. Activity monitoring. 2. Value setting. 3. Activity Scheduling 4. Troubleshooting Let's look at each in turn and how Nick could use them to steadily crawl out of his hole of depression. Remember how Clara began her process of cognitive restructuring by just becoming aware? It's the same for Nick. The first step is for him to just understand what is actually happening for him in his life as it is now. Activity Monitoring First, Nick gathers data on how he spends his time. Instead of monitoring thoughts, he's monitoring actions and behaviors via looking at his day-to-day -day activities. Using an Excel spreadsheet of his own design, you can find ready-made activity sheets online if you like, he records everything he does for a full week. Every hour, including sleep, he notes what activities he does. No activity is too small or obvious or insignificant. While he does this, Nick also records his overall mood. This is done by simply noting, hour by hour, where his mood falls on a scale of 1 to 10. At the end of the week, Nick has some valuable data to explore. Reviewing the chart, he can start to see patterns. He asks himself, What was I doing when I felt the best? And when I felt the worst. What is the overall relationship between my activity levels and my mood? How did I feel on days when I was very inactive? For example, not leaving the house, not showering, or not tidying up. Now, Nick can complete a list of activities that he knows make him feel good. He has the concrete evidence. He can draw up a feel-good list, as well as a feel-bad one. His feel-good list might contain the following items. Taking a walk and getting some fresh air. Spending time with friends. Doing a hobby. His feel-bad list includes these items. Staying in bed past 10 a.m. Gaming. Scrolling social media in bed with the lights off. Now, all of the above may seem pretty obvious to you and me. But the truth is that when we can see, in black and white, how our mood literally rises and falls without our activity level, it can create a few light bulb moments. If you try this yourself, you might also be surprised at a few things that you thought made you feel good, but don't, and vice versa. Value Setting Now, in just the same way that Clara became curious about cognitive alternatives, Nick is going to ask himself about activity or behavioral alternatives. For Clara, a thought is appraised as a good one when it's healthy, rational, accurate, and so on. But how can Nick determine which behaviors to keep and which to change? The answer is his values. You might think, isn't the fact of his negative mood the real hint? The truth is, we all feel low when we're not living according to our values. So, we can take depression, lack of motivation, etc., as symptoms of a bigger problem, our living out of alignment with what we value. Engage in those activities that flow from your values, the theory goes, and you gradually pull yourself out of the spiral of negativity. Trying to address the negativity alone is like trying to correct the course of a ship without knowing which direction you're wanting to go in the first place. Only you can decide what your values are. 
they will not be the same as other people's. In fact, they can change over time, even for you. What do you think is most important in life? What's the ideal way that you want to interact with others, behave, think, see yourself? It's not being able to achieve these ideals that makes us happy. We can live meaningful and rich lives simply by understanding what we value and knowing that we are working each day toward those values. This gives purpose, direction, motivation, dignity, and resilience. Pause and ask what you most value about being alive right now. Then, read the following list and see which ones speak to you most. Family. Be it tradition, loving connection, duty, or simply a sense of belonging. It could mean mastering the task of parenthood and serving others. Romantic love. That could mean a successful marriage, passion, commitment, or a deep and transcendent bond with another person. Community, friendship, and social life. A different kind of love, but no less powerful. Spirituality or religion. Do you value contemplation, the mystical or inner life, a union with God, or a spiritual and personal development path all your own creation? Learning and knowledge. The love of developing understanding and mastery. Material stability, wealth, financial success. Yes, it's okay to have this as a value. Beauty, poetry. Art. Are you supremely driven by aesthetic concerns? There's not really a fixed list of human values. What's important is to make sure that they're really your values, not your parents, not your social groups, and not something you were told you should want by the media, for example. Perhaps you choose three things that are most important to you. Stuck. A great way to home in on values is to ask, When have I felt most satisfied or alive or happy myself? What value is being met at that moment? If I could achieve just one thing during my time on earth, what would it be? Think of someone you completely dislike and disagree with. What is the opposite value? What does this dislike tell you? about what you find most important. For Nick, honest contemplation tells him that he most values independence, honesty, and kindness. Those are the principles he wants to build his life around. Activity Scheduling Behavioral activation is all about what you do, though, not just what you think and feel. Now, Write down a list of activities that you can practically do, and think of this as a kind of recipe for certain good feelings. Choose activities based on what you already know feels good from when you monitored yourself earlier, but also activities that speak to your values. Nick decides that he will add to his feel-good list the following activities. Volunteer with kids at his community center book a therapy session, start exploring options for creating his own business. He notices that just writing these down gives him a jolt of energy, a good sign that they speak to a person's needs and values. Now, Nick can start building his life from scratch, one activity at a time. He looks at a schedule and plans every hour. He makes sure to include the basics, sleep, grooming, time for meals, etc., but prioritizes those activities he already knows speak to his values and make him feel good. That's important. These activities are scheduled in first. He decides what he'll do, when he'll do it, for how long, where, and who with. He's keenly aware of why he's doing it. Nothing external is forcing him. Rather, He's doing it because it will help him achieve what he wants to achieve. Nick also finds it helpful to rank activities on a hierarchy. Some are better for him than others. 
He also ranks them by how difficult they are to do. You guessed it. He chooses the activities that yield the greatest number of positive feelings while costing him the least motivation. That way, he builds momentum, generating good feelings that he can then reinvest into other, more energetically expensive activities. Every Sunday evening, he plans his week ahead down to the hour. He doesn't see this as a chore. After all, he knows that if he gets it right, the outcome will be plenty of happy, satisfied feelings. Troubleshooting Does Nick manage to change his life completely after one week? Of course not. But he diligently appraises how it went and makes adjustments. He knows that being depressed distorts his view on things, so he gives each activity a fair try, at least twice, before deciding he doesn't want to do it. When he doesn't stick to his plan, he doesn't beat himself up or throw the whole schedule out the window. He just becomes curious about why it didn't work and asks himself what will work and what he can do for next time. The interesting thing about Nick is that only once he makes headway with his activity schedule in this way and maintains that momentum for a few months is he able to start looking at his thoughts and feelings like Clara did. Once Nick creates a healthier, more supportive environment for himself, he's naturally more able to spot and challenge his cognitive distortions. And that's it for this week's episode of The Science of Self. Be sure to sign up for the author's email list at bit.ly slash Peter Hollins. And don't miss our next episode next Thursday. Our birthday list for today includes award-winning singer and songwriter Amy Winehouse, American footballer Deshaun Watson, and actor and producer Tyler Perry. From the history book today, Francis Scott Key writes America's national anthem, The Star-Spangled Banner, in 1814, rapper Tupac Shakur dies six days after a drive-by shooting, and the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have died today. Lastly, Ann Richards, educator and former governor of Texas, dies in 2006. She gives us this bit of a warning today. I've always said that in politics, your enemies can't hurt you, but your friends will kill you. 